I'm Terrence Barkin, the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, and we're hosting today's webinar on enhancing graphene through chemical functionalization. For those of you who are not familiar with the Graphene Council, we're a global trade and professional body representing the graphene sector. We connect more than 35,000 materials professionals worldwide with an interest in this topic. Graphene functionalization is incredibly important. It's one of the key elements to making graphene dispersible in host materials and to unlocking some of its other properties. We're really pleased to have one of our member companies here today, Kenrick Petrochemicals, and presented by Sal Monte, who um, is an expert in this field and has quite a bit of experience that he's gonna share with us today. And with that, Sal, I'm gonna hand over to you. Okay, appreciate the introduction and uh, the wonderful opportunity to talk to so many uh, people involved in the field of functionalization of the interface. Um, Okay. The outline of today's presentation will follow uh, my biography, some technical information on our website. We'll talk about key uh, takeaways from this presentation. Uh, some of the information Terrence Barkin uh, gave me. Um, uh, we'll talk about the problem, the solution, next steps, and the title of the talk. Then we'll get into the invention of the technology, the 50 year evolution, how I started in 1973 and how we are here 50 years later, uh, talking about graphene and the interface. We'll talk about the six functions of the titanate and zirconate molecule and why they're different than silanes and how they're different. We'll talk about the nano application, the selection, dosage, solubility sequence. Uh, the secret to uh, nanotechnology is proper technique and boy, that's so important. A little bit of who, about who I am. Um, I am a um, participant in many organizations. I'm a voting member uh, of the Recycle Subcommittee. I'm a SBE fellow and armed service member. I'm on the board of governors of the Plastics Pioneers Association. I'm their newsletter chair. I have over 450 ACS cast abstracted works. I have 34 U.S. patents found worldwide. I've been classified top six for the U.S. Defense and Sensitive Munitions and Energetic Materials Program, and a little bit about class, being classified top secret for the Sensitive Munitions Program, because that was really a complicated problem, and how is it relevant to graphene functionalization? If you think exfoliating graphene is complex, try, and, try to make a bomb safer and uh, yet more powerful, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, they had been working on this uh, since the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, with a, a propellant that was a 85% uh, graph uh, of a nitramine explosive dispersant cellulose acetate butyrate going through a 19 perf dye, and they were having problems with sensitivity because the interface of the uh, nitramine with the CAB was aging and uh, it became unsafe, and a lot of Israeli tankers were being uh, uh, destroyed because the uh, propellants were exploding inside the tank and killing uh, the tankers without any enemy fire. If you look at RDX, which was the material we were dispersing at 85% solids in the cellulose acetate butyrate and graphene, they're both organic materials. They both have no hydroxyl groups, and this is important for people who are fooling around with silanes with graphene. The fact that there are no hydroxyl groups is what is the challenge with silane chemistry. So uh, they are both non silane reactive and they both are functionalized by using a nano titanium phosphorus uh, coupling agent. Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, tried to describe the functionalization with the titanates that we produce uh, by the six functions. And function three, phosphorization, was one of the keys to making the ammunition safer. And this was based on experience we had with general dynamics on graphite reinforced number sets and also with graphite uh, reinforced epoxy. We did dynamic TGAs. And if you would see, this is typically what happens uh, with the uh, graphite uh, when it's exposed to uh, uh, heat at 300 degrees centigrade, the interface deteriorates. But if you put an atomic monolayer of phosphorus titanium on the graphite, it goes out to 800 degrees C before it begins to fall off. And that's because of the atomic monolayer of the phosphorus titanium on the interface of the graphite. So uh, this information and a lot of what I'm talking about is on our, our website. We're updating it right now, but it has a lot of information already. There are lots of links, drives my IP uh, attorneys crazy because they give away a lot of information free. Uh, but uh, you have to educate in order to, to sell this technology because there's so much 
uh, know-how going in to using uh, it properly that you really can't do it by just pouring it into a into a mixer it's just like graphene graphene's wonderful but if you don't exfoliate it it doesn't do anything typical presentation if you clicked on this link you would get processing uh, uh, of materials and then there's also lots of information inside those uh, documents and almost all the slides that i'm showing on this presentation we're going to show 182 slides and we're going fast as hell so you can't absorb it all but you can always go back and click on the links and uh, get a copy of this presentation and start to study it in more detail. Because, for example, one link is on the extruder as a reactor for advanced mechanical recycling using the tight dates. And in that uh, presentation, uh, we show um, what happened. Uh, I think I'm, 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 I think I hit a link to, a, to, to the website. <laughs> uh -huh. Let me get back on. Okay, we show the uh, 158 slides. And in addition to that, uh, we have lots of technical papers. Uh, this is a SAMPI paper we did on uh, fiber reinforced thermosets. And a lot of the work to date uh, has been done uh, with thermoset polymers uh, because they're liquids and you can make them into solids by curing. Uh, but the unique part of our chemistry is that it will work in thermoplastics uh, without any cross-link mechanism by virtue of the chemical bonding. In addition to the technical papers I've written and the chemical abstracts that we have available, I wrote a 340-page Kenriac reference manual, and we have lots of searches. We did this search uh, with the chemical abstract services from 2019 to 2021. And we found uh, uh, out there without cast numbers put into the search engine, 115 graph graphene uh, abstracts being written by other investigators, 178 on graphite and 109 on carbon nanotubes. And if you take those abstracts out of the literature, uh, this one is the one that was done at the Fraunhofer Institute for uh, Chemical Technology in Germany. And it's the development of a carbon nanotube and graphite filled polyphenylene sulfide based bipolar plates for albanadium redox flow batteries. And batteries are a big deal right now. And if you go into our reference manual in 1984, one of the pictures we show is a polyphenylene sulfide extrusion in which the uh, aromatic, aromatic, aromatic amino zirconate is making the PPS flow much, much better. And uh, apparently the Fraunhofer guys uh, saw this and tried it with the carbon nanotubes and it worked for them. In the abstract, it says the torque and apparent viscosity of samples decreased significantly with coupling agent, and as a result, the flow behavior is positively affected. And they go on to show you the improvement in the properties that they were seeking uh, with the um, uh, carbon nanotube with the coupling agent in the system. Okay, key takeaways that I want you to get from this presentation. Number one is the challenge. Graphene needs to be exfoliated in the finished product to deliver the performance problem. The biggest disappointment in graphene is that it always seems not to meet the goals or meet the promise that it, that it makes. And that the reason is it's just not being exfoliated properly and the chemistry of the interface needs to be improved. Uh, the, another problem is the silent mindset. I, I've been battling the silent mindset since I gave my first talk uh, at the interface session of the Composites Institute of the Plessis Industry Association back in 1976 in Washington, D.C., in which Dr. Ed Pluderman was the uh, moderator for the session. And all the sessions on interfacial surface modification were on silanes, and I was the only non-silane talk. And I think the, uh, the graphene interface is non-reactive with silanes, and uh, the biggest problem is trying to get it functionalized with the uh, with the coupling agent. Uh, the silane mindset is not the approach as far as I'm concerned because we, with the one and a half nanometer titrates and zirconates, unlike silane, form a ton monoglase via proton coordination. In other words, on the hydrogen, we don't need hydroxyl groups, and that's the key. You don't need to go through a tremendous amount of uh, surface preparation of the uh, graphene in order to get it reactive with uh, 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 with hydroxyl groups to react in a hydrolysis mechanism and a four-step process with silanes. It's just straight on proton coordination. All you got to do is make sure that you've got your sequence of addition right, your solubility parameters right, and you're making contact in atomic monolays. So you can do the reaction in situ in, in the organic water phase, uh, and you can affect 
deagglomeration with one and a half nanometer spacing with the titanate organofunctional titanate. Not only that, the titanate or zirconate catalyzes and flexibilizes the polymer phase surrounding uh, the graphene. So you're having an effect on the morphology of the polymer, and this allows for stress transition from the interface of the graphene into the polymer phase, giving you better impact strength and better flexibility. Uh, all of this requires, of course, nano application techniques. You form atomic monolayers on the carbon interface via proton coordination, which means the graphene interface as is, no oxidation, no acids, no none of the stuff that you have to do in order to get the graphene reactable. So titanates, and my prediction is that titanates and zirconates will be the graphene composites, what suddenly is worth the fiberglass composites. Okay, Terence tried to straighten me out in an email, said, Sal, you got to tell them what the problem is to be solved. What is the solution? What are they going to be the next steps? And as the title, I would like to have this uh, graphene functionalization title, which we're using. Okay, so uh, Terrence states, very basically, here's the structure of your presentation. What is the problem to be solved? Graphene is difficult to exfoliate down to just a few layers. Once graphene is exfoliated, it has a tendency to reagglomerate. If graphene can be chemically bonded to a host material, it is more likely to transfer its beneficial properties and strength. That's the goal. And what is the solution? What are, what are you describing, Sal? What are you going to tell these people? Give them a short description of your recommended approach, which materials you're going to use. Give them the idea of the mechanisms. And what are the next steps? How do you want to work with these companies? And uh, as a title, I would like to use enhancing graphene through chemical chemical functionalization. Okay, so we use that, uh, and I, I agreed with that because from the moment uh, I started getting into this technology, I was trying to understand what the hell is going on also, and I developed this concept of six functions trying to describe, you know, how we can reduce the viscosity at the same time increase the mechanical properties. That's so opposite to plasticizer logic, uh, and I wasn't used to that, and uh, if you look in our reference manual on page two, I had visualized this deagglomeration at the interface of pigments in figure two, and then in figure, uh, the figure on the right-hand side shows the deagglomeration, and that SEM was taken four years after I drew the graphic on the left. So a little bit of this is visionary, and uh, part of that concept was developing these structures. We just got in the lab, and this was back in the old days before you had to do pre-manufacture notification. I'm doing one now on pine tar for plant-based uh, titanate uh, because we're being very successful in cosmetics and I'm running out of the plant-based uh, stearic acid we're using. And uh, I want to develop a, a more with an American-based uh, pine tar source. And I've already spent about 40 grand on the pre-manufacturing notification process that we still don't have permission to, to sample the product. And we finally got a cast number for the structure. Anyway, it, it, it's a deal now to introduce new chemistry, but we have about 60 commercial molecules and about 115 on the books. I also wrote a book called Functional, uh, I wrote a chapter for a book uh, that, that Professor Xanthos wrote on functional fillers for plastics. And if you get into functionalizing fillers, silanes always come up. That's chapter four. I wrote chapter five, titanate coupling agents. And uh, we gave many, many seminars and participated in conferences based on functionalization. And uh, we're in all, uh, we're in 680 EU reach uh, approved cosmetic formulations. Half of them are for eyeshadows and lipstick. Uh, uh, and uh, what they do is make the lipstick long lasting and brighter. So, uh, as Terence said, what is the problem? Graphene is difficult to exfoliate down to a few layers. Exfoliation separating platelets with one and a half nanometer atomic monolayers is what titanates and zirconates do. That's what we do. On the right hand side, we'll discuss the exfoliation of the material. Once graphene is exfoliated, it has a tendency to reagglomerate. Reagglomeration is prevented by interfacial metallic monolayers, so it does not reagglomerate. If graphene can be chemically bonded to a host material, it's more likely to transfer its beneficial properties. Graphene can be chemically bonded with atomic monolayers of organofunctional titanium or zirconium. And then Terence again says, if graphene can be chemically bonded to the host material, it's more likely to transfer its properties. And I say graphite. Graphene can be chemically bonded with atomic monolayers of organofunctional titanium or zirconium. I know it sounds like, you know, we're doing an act, but this really is what happens. Uh, uh, the question usually raised, well, is the chemical bond covalent? Is it permanent? In our experience, based on what investigators reported, the bond is covalent. 
and the complication of performance bears it out. In so many aging tests over the last four or five decades, uh, I can't show you them all, but there, there are things like the Kevex analysis of a uh, chelated uh, uh, phosphato, uh, power phosphato titanate on copper, showing the phosphorus and titanium and the copper elements right on the Kevex analysis, showing an atomic monolayer formulation. And many, many technical papers. This one uh, showing that the surface of the two fillers were functionalized to form covalent bonds between the epoxy and the filler, uh, redu thereby reducing thermal interfacial resistance. And this was with boron nitride and carbon nanotubes in epoxy. And the material they use uh, at the bottom is a graphic of it. It's an aromatic amino zirconate. Uh, we have a product called SM7SN, which is a modification of this material. Uh, one of the problems we have is uh, by the time you disclose the chemistry and the cast number and do the filing with the uh, US EPA Tosca and with the reach of uh, the material, you disclose just about everything, but who, uh, who's doing the uh, reaction on the uh, on the extruder on the midnight shift. And uh, protecting your intellectual property is really difficult. So we are recommending this SM7SN as an aromatic amino zirconate for thermoset systems. Uh, going on, some of the other abstracts was surface adhesion improvement of carbon fiber reinforced uh, 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 polycarbonate. And this is showing the SEM uh, of the upper uh, fiber is without the uh, coupling agent and the bottom is with the aliphatic amino titanate showing the adhesion of the polymer uh, to the uh, uh, carbon interface. Uh, the other studies have been done with organic materials. And what was interesting about <clears throat> this particular work in, in India was that the high contact angle and less hydroxyl groups on the titanate treated fibers led to enhanced hydrophobicity over other treatments. And we'll get into a discussion of that in that one of the problems with hydrolysis with silanes is that you leave water on the interface. And that really prevents long, that really presents long term aging issues and also problems with water boil aging tests. <clears throat> Finally, this is a Japanese pa uh, paper, Japanese uh, treating me like a rock star. In the 70s, I went to Osaka in Japan, in Tokyo, Japan, and talked for five hours before four societies and the microelectronics and all the videotape coming out of Japan that came afterwards were all based on uh, atomic monolayers of phosphorus titanium on the gamma ferric oxide for magnetic recording media. And anyway, in this paper, they said they've done SEM, XPS, and all the other analytical techniques, and the result demonstrates the effectiveness of the titanate coupling agent in improving the compatibility and interfacial bonding between the carbon fiber and the epoxy resin. So, you know, we're not selling real estate here. We're selling chemistry and technology, and uh, you're going to, you know, eventually, if you're going to evaluate it, get a sample and test it. It's got to work for you. And that's what we're going to try to do. And the answer comes in three parts. We couple the organofunctional titanium uh, on the graphene and atomic monolayers. We give you the instructions how to use them in thermosets and whether it's waterborne or high solids or solvent borne. And in thermoplastics, the last one is the kind of equipment you use, what kind of dry, dry powder blending equipment you have. How do you melt processes that are using a Banbury or using a twin screw extruder? Uh, all these are important questions to address because it's important to get the right physical form and the right sequence and the right dosage to make the technology work. And the, the selection depends on many variables. You, basically, you, you, you get into a consulting discussion uh, and sometimes an NDA with the customer on uh, discussing the polarity of the polymer, the compound ingredients, the end property desired, what curators is involved, what kind of editors, editors are you already using. Many times you come into systems where they're already using surfactants and other materials, which really interfere with the interface and you got to work out uh, running controls on the controls. Okay, how do we get there from here? Graphene is we all, uh, graphene is offered as master batches in water and organic systems. Uh, straight graphene by itself is problematic in, in many operations because of the, the nature of nano materials and the handling of them. It's much better to have a master batch, and there are many companies coming on board uh, or already offering these uh, uh, graphitic materials in various uh, uh, systems in various forms. And all I want you to know is that. We know that because Kemmerich got to start uh, making aromatic resins, and those aromatic resins were great pol polar plasticizers, and we use them to make massive batches of metal oxides like litharge and red lead for high voltage wiring cable. And you know what it is to get a UL approval in a high voltage cable. 
So we had experience with three row mills, two row mills, Banbury's, and we got that experience because Carriage was started by uh, three graduates from the University of Kentucky who wanted to get rich with an aromatic resin. Basically, they were doing sustainability by taking the bottoms of gasoline fractionation, uh, which were heavily aromatic and uh, reacting with formaldehyde in the formulation condensation reaction to make a tetramer of dimethylnaphthalene and it turned out to be a terrific plasticizer. But as always with entrepreneurs and, and inventions, it takes a lot longer and a lot more money than anybody anticipates because change is difficult. Uh, anyway, by uh, 1961, uh, DuPont approved uh, the Kenflex A in the Iblon and neoprene uh, high voltage systems, and Carriage moved to Bayonne, New Jersey. We expanded in 2015. We moved operations to Tennessee, and we have operations in both Decatur and in Dayton, Tennessee. And these are ISO 9001 certified plants with a lot of experience. And our experience in dispersions carries into the graphene technology. Uh, it started back in 80, in 73 when I was trying to get 85% of French processed zinc oxide in a naphthenic oil wax situation. If you don't think that's pertinent, just yesterday, a customer uh, had an email to me saying that they're currently dispersing with uh, stearic acid and waxing. Can we do any better? And boy, oh boy, have I been through that stuff. That Because that was the old technology, you know, uh, uh, back in uh, uh, the, uh, 73, we were trying to make a uh, a extrusion of a 85% uh, zinc oxide in this wax, that phenic oil blood, and uh, we couldn't get there at all until I uh, invented this titanate. And when we uh, 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 printed the first Kenriac reference value, which is basically on the KRTTS, the questions always asked were, which titanate to use, how much titanate to use, what are the effects, when to use it, where to use it, and how to use it. So we try to address that all the time. The, the basic invention was to transesterify three moles of isosteric acid onto uh, one mole of tetraisopropyl titanate to get an isopropoxy triisosteryl titanate. And that's what we were envisioning, putting this atomic monolayer on the zinc oxide. And this is the chemical structure of the first titanate we uh, uh, we invented. And this is what we conceived in our mind, the atomic monolayer on the zinc oxide. And when we put a half a percent of the titanate into the zinc oxide, boy, it was magic. The viscosity dropped from 1,600,000 down to 12,800 centipoise, and the amount of energy you needed to, to get the dispersion was tremendously reduced. Now, to get to that point, we had tried stearic acid, ethoxylated nonophenol, and other other additives like Turch 12, 15, S9, and isosteric and stearic acid itself. But when you put the sterile organo functionality onto the titanium, you get like light to laser, the atomic effect is 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 incredible and the viscosity drops like a rock and the amount you need really is sensitive to dosage and intensive percent uh you get big changes in viscosity and there are optimization dosages at a half percent for example on the xerox patent on making video uh, tape and, and magnetic recording medium and digital copy of toner they tell you a half percent of is the best copy of toner ever produced with the specific air, uh, density readings, the best ever. 1% is worse than the control. So you just can't slop this stuff in at any dosage or oh, let's try a little bit more. You got to really do the, do the homework. Uh, TTS is approved in many, many complex cosmetic formulations. And uh, we have been uh, talking about carbon block and the graphite interface and the graphene interface for many, many years in the rubber industry. Uh, we've been we produce master batches of Vulcan XC seventy two R block, and three row mill them for our customers in silicone and other materials. And if you look at uh, the specification on XC seventy two R Vulcan uh, uh, conductor block, you see they say right there that they they have aggregations of thirty to sixty nanometer sized particles. In other words, this they sit on the fact that they make this fine particle uh, carbon block, and then it agglomerates, and that's what they sell. And it's a great uh, system for uh, uh, conductivity. And uh, we found Kenryac Glyco 9 is directly water emulsifiable. It's a neopental dioxy tridodestyl benzene sulfonyl titanate. It's, it's the only one that we have that's directly water emulsifiable. So we 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 tested what would happen if we put uh, the Glyco 9 into the water and then put in the conductor block. Now the left hand beaker 
is the conductor block sitting on water because all the water don't mix and carbon block doesn't disperse in water. And on the right is the reaction at the interface with the like 9 already dispersing the water, attacking the surface of the gra of, of the carbon block. It's the same process you're going to do with graphene. You're going to put the couple of gauges into the organic or liquid or water phase first, and then you're going to bring in the graphene uniformly and disperse it and react. Look at the reaction that takes place. There's no mechanical stirring. There's no... Nothing mechanically at the interface between the block and the water and the depth of uh, uh, uh titanate totally deagglomerates the carbon. And you have a way now to deagglomerate graphene interface the same way with like 9 in the water phase. Okay, so this kind of effect, once you've got that block treated, it goes into polyolefins, for example, and the conductivity is much more improved. In silicone, we saw the resistivity uh, reduced from 240 to 160 ohm dot centimeter on volume. Uh, in doing SBR, we took 3.75% of the block and we treated it with different amounts of the LICO 9. And with just 1% by weight of the block, we were able to go from 10 to the 14 down to 10 to the 7th on the, on the resistivity. That's a very significant drop in, uh, in the resistivity or improvement in the conductivity because what you're doing is exfoliating the conductor block breaking up the agglomerated uh, uh, nanoparticles and, and causing more three-dimensional contact through a polymer phase where oil, uh, where the uh, air and water has been eliminated and you're getting true optimal conductivity out of the surface contact. And notice between one and 2%, you get no more conductance because you've deagglomerated that block as much as you possibly can. In an HAF carbon block, uh, we study the effect of the uh, neocoxy pyrophosphate titanate on the mechanical properties of SBR. On the upper uh, is a picture of the agglomerate, on the bottom is the deagglomeration caused by the titanate. And what's impressive is the uh, improvement in the mechanical properties. On aging, after 48 hours, your tensile strength is at 2,890 with the, with the titanate and 1,870 without, with the control. And look at the re-elongation. Not only is it more flexible, it's softer. Okay, so you improve the aging by 54%, the elongation by 41%, and the stress strain properties, elongation and tensile, that's the flexibility, that's your impact strength, and that's the things you want for transfer of energy, and you made the material softer in the process. Okay, in, in a, uh, a, a two-component, uh, a 2K urethane, uh, we post-added the KL44 to a vortex of the uh, mixture of the uh, block with the, uh, the the urethane. If you just dumped the KL44 in, it would not be as effective. You literally got to let the KL44 titanate attack the interface of the block under a dynamic uh, condition. So if the couple of agents in the liquid phase are ready, to, you bring in the, uh, the graphene uniformly. If the graphene's already in the liquid phase, you agitate it uh, significantly, and then you add the couple of agents dropwise or spray it on if you can. Uh, these are commercial materials. We're not talking theory here. We're talking about stuff that we make in a plant and we ship in, uh, on pallets and in drums. And they, these things have been screened throughout the world. There are many, many inventories. And uh, we're talking about real world uh, chemistry uh, because we've been serving uh, the Fortune 500 for, for decades with these materials. In describing the functionality, I like to talk about the six functions with function one being the proton coordination uh, of the high, of the neopental dioxy group with the interface of the material and function two, this is critical. Understanding the fact that titanium and zirconium, titanocenes and zirconocenes, are the foundation of all addition polymers, zeolitic catalysis. They also are the foundation for uh, transesterification and making of polyesters. So the titanium functionality is a very important part of this whole thing. Putting atomic monolayers of organofunctional titanium really functionalizes the graphene surface to become interactive with the polymer phase in a, in a sense that you're making the graphene into a super catalyst. And then when you add the phosphorization aspect, you can in effect make the graphene into a flame retardant. Uh, you can uh, put the uh, functionality from aromatic to aliphatic uh, 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 naphthenic rings, and all of these will affect the polarity of the interface with the polymer phase. And the function five thermosets, there's acrylic, methacrylic, and mecapto groups that are also available. And in hybridization, 
Uh, we talk about uh, the effect of different ways to um, um, affect the material. In function one catalysis, we'll, we'll talk about adding the coupling agent to the liquid phase, followed by the addition of the uh, uh, particulate to be, to be coupled. The deagglomeration of the calcium carbonate is clear. In, uh, not only are you getting viscosity reduction, which is nice, but you can do that with surfactants in many cases. But what you're getting is organofunctionality, you're getting titanium organofunctionality, and you're getting complete permanent deagglomeration, and you're getting elimination of the air voids and moisture. When you do that, you've got a continuous phase, and then all of the good properties are maintained over the long term. Okay, because you deagglomerate, you exfoliate, you hydrophobe, you catalyze, and you functionalize, and therefore you optimize. And that's the whole purpose of the, uh, the function. Now, when we first got started talking about wetting out calcium carbonate, wow, what a revolution compared to xylanes, we didn't realize that when we got the 70% three micron fill polypropylene homopolymer that we thought it was because we were wetting out and deagglomerating the calcium carbonate. We didn't understand fully was the fact that the titanate itself was uh, repolymerizing the polymer phase itself, independent of the calcium carbonate. In fact, the calcium carbonate was just carrying the titanate catalyst. So we understood as we went along <clears throat> that this function two catalysis is very important and it makes and compatibilizes the sim similar polymers one to seven. So you're able to uh, now co-polymerize different polymers with their additional condensation polymers. And the amount you need is about 0.3%. The sweet pot spot is between two to four parts per thousand in the on-fill polymer. And the flexibility is independent of the filler content of any curative or cross-link mechanism. Thus, tougher functional polymer compositions with greater adhesion to a variety of substrates are possible. Now, this is what there were over 5,000 patents by other investigators based on these basic concepts. We filed a patent called repolymerization, and I went with my uh, age, uh, my attorney from London. We went over to Zurich, and we stood before a tribunal of three judges for three days defending this patent. And we said we took 11 thermoplastics with six different titanates and six different zirconates at uh, several different layers, and we demonstrate that we improve the, we increase the flow, we increase the tensile, we increase the elongation, and we increase the impact strength of the materials in low dosages. And we finally got the patent issued in, in Europe. <clears throat> you do a simple test. You take ethylene propylene uh, rubber. This was just on 404. You throw it on a three row mill, a thousand grams. What will happen to the on filled EPD, uh, EPR? It, it, it pulls together. It's got nerve. You put in two parts per thousand of a phosphatotitrate, it's like adding 15 parts of ordinary plasticizer. In a vinyl system, vinyl, flexible vinyl system, one drum of titanate will replace 90 drums of conventional plasticizer. I know this sounds incredible, but it's true. It's just the kind of claims you guys make in graphene. We we, we, we have the same issues where we say we will replace 15 pH of plasticizer with two parts per thousand of titanate. Oh, how can that be? It's not possible. Well, it is possible. We do it. Uh, here's an example. On the left-hand side is an extrusion uh, compound. This was recycled clear PVC. And they cut those chips into squares and they're the housing for microchips. And uh, if you put in uh, two parts per thousand of a cyclohydrum pyrophosphate of zirconate, you were able to double the line speed and lower the temperature from 360 down to 275 degrees Fahrenheit or a drop of 47 degrees centigrade and still get the same flow, which is important in PVC because heat sensitivity is always an issue. Uh, combining uh, an addition with a condensation polymer is difficult with malleated polypropylene, for example, of course, malleated uh, materials often will depolymerize a condensation polymer. So when you start to do mechanical recycling with uh, addition and condensation polymers, you have depolymerization issues. And with the titanate, you don't have those issues. And we were able to combine lots of different uh, products. Here we're doing it at 100 degrees centigrade, lower temperature. Uh, between uh, two uh, condensation polymers. Uh, this is a customer we've had for almost three decades. They were injection molding uh, 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 sharpeners for knives, and uh, the base of the of the uh, sharpener uh, was 40% fiberglass filled polycarbonate. They bought the pellets from a custom compounder, and they were having problems with uh, thermal uh, with the stability uh, of, of the well line flow and also the 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 material itself. And they put in 1% of, of a, we made a pellet master batch uh, and 1% contains 
20% of the active titanate. And with that 1% addition, they were able to get the product on the bottom half of the screen. You can see the smoothness, the brightness of the colors, and uh, they were able to do it at 180 degrees uh, lower temperature. Okay, so the liquid coupling agent can be added to the liquid color concentrate and then added to the hopper. So there's different ways to do it. So long as you're getting it solubilized into an organic phase first, and well dispersed before it sees the graphene, you can use that organic phase to attack the interface of the graphene. Here, we're putting it into an HDPE blow molded material and adding it right to the liquid color, and they were able to, with the coupling agent, get 60% more regrowing to the product, use 21.8% less HDPE, in other words, thinner gauge, uh, at lower temperatures and faster cycle times. Now, nanotechnology, we talk about it all the time, but I like to say that you know, you, you talk about the length of a meter and all that stuff, and a lot of people just can't relate to that. But if you say the nanometer is the length of your fingernail, a thumbnail grows in a second, and you look at your thumbnail, how long, how much did it grow in a second? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about that kind of thickness. You can't see it. You can't see it on the SEM. You can't see it on the TEM. You can only you, you, you can only do it with acoustic emission testing or with uh, using atomic force spectroscopy. Who the hell has atomic force spectroscopy uh, access? It takes a very sophisticated lab to do that kind of stuff. So we basically deal with cause and effect and watching what happens when we do things in certain ways with certain dosages. The key to making this stuff work in thermoplastics, and even in thermosets for that matter, is that when the coupling agent goes into a polymeric phase, uh, it changes the, uh, the, the, the molecular weight distribution, the low molecular fraction uh, becomes less, yet it flows more, I don't know what it's called, narrow molecular weight, there's a whole bunch of analysis. Uh, PhDs can get their thesis based on trying to understand what the chemistry of this catalysis is, because, I mean, ExxonMobil has a billion dollar patent position just on metallocenes, and Kaminsky got outstanding achievement awards for his invention of, uh, of metallocenes. So there's a lot to be understood about catalysis of polymers, but here's what we know. If you put the coupling agent into a thermoplastic phase, the torque drops. If so, if you've got a, 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 a control condition with temperature sets, and you've got the coupling agent in that polymer phase, that twin, twin screw has become a pump. It's not doing any shear. You've got to lower the temperatures to get the torque back up because the area under the torque versus time curve is your specific energy input. That's where the work energy goes at the interface. And if you don't lower the temperatures, not because we're trying to save energy, we're doing it because we need to get the viscosity back up to get the torque back up to get the work back into the interface because that's the key to having success. We did uh, work in Toronto uh, with an expert uh, who had good access uh, to, to one of the labs in, in the Toronto University. And we worked with LLDP, polypropylene, and PET, uh, these three uh, 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 recycled materials, if you will. And uh, we found that when we took the Bray Bender blend and injection molded it at these different temperatures, the degree of dispersion improved significantly just by getting more shear at the interface. So it goes on and on with no matter what the combination is with the graphene, make sure you've got your control of your viscosity because we can catalyze but you need to have the reaction and the shear to get it to be, to go. Another aspect is that in order to get these things to work, for example, in the water phase, they either got to be co-solvated with texanol. Uh, we sell quartz, but the problem with quartz is you use amines, uh, which make them somewhat hydrophilic, or you can uh, mix them with uh, tergitols and make emulsions out of them. But here's an example where we're taking a John Krill 537, 43% styrene, uh, water-based acrylic, laying it onto uh, a, uh, a tin plate used in automotive, and then subjecting it to a corrosion uh, test. And you can see that a one-inch mandrel bend, uh, you're getting poor adhesion of the acrylic, and you're getting corrosion on the interface. By co-solvating an aromatic amino, uh, in this case, we use a pyrophosphate zirconate, uh, we were able to uh, get to one quarter inch mandrel bend that proves the adhesion, flexibilization, and prevent corrosion. So you're getting all three functions going for you, even function four in that case. We've done tests with uh, uh, epoxy, uh, with uh, uh, silica, with pyrophosphate titanate. And if you take, uh, this is the end of a, of a, a very large investigation, but the, this is the silica without the pyrophosphate titanate, and this is the silica with 
the pyrophosphatidyl titanate. We, we were measuring it against basic lead silica chromate at back when silica, uh, when chrome uh, chromates were still being used in coatings. And with the, the pyrophosphatidyl titanate and the silica, we outperformed the basic lead silica chromate. So you can convert silica into a functional anti-corrosive pigment, and you can do the same thing uh, with, uh, with graphene. Okay, the sixth function is a little bit more explanation as to why the titanate zirconate molecule is different than the silanes. And if you look at the six functions of the titanate or zirconate molecule and compare it to the silane, basically the silanes are just alkoxy groups. Anyway, the original ones were, and now they have all kinds of variants on it. But the fundamental thesis is you do a hydrolysis mechanism, get the silane to stick to the surface through the hydroxyl groups, and then you, you hang off these uh, groups, mainly thermoset functionality, amine groups, macapto groups, uh, cross-linkable groups with UV and IR. Well, our approach is just that, you know, if you get the interface compatibilized, you don't need to have this wide functionality thermoset reactivity to get a lot of the benefits uh, because the bonding and the uh, elimination of air voids and moisture and the continuous phase just makes the system stronger, independent of the cross-link mechanism. You can still do that, and we have wide functional group materials. But, but the big difference between us and the silanes is that this titanium oxygen bond is catalytic, and the silicon bond is not as catalytic. And the fact that we have X groups in the form of phosphorus and pyrophosphate, which gives you the anti-corrosion flame retardant effects that are so valuable, and the R groups marrying up the polarity, addressing the fact that you're working with a polyolefin Polyolefins are terrible on polarity. They don't wet well. Same thing with fluorinated polymers. They don't wet well. And how do you get them to be compatibilized? Well, you use nonpolar all groups that will compatibilize. So it basically is a quick overview of the six functions. And if you look at the atomic table and the molecular weight of silicone and then titanium and zirconium, uh, the titanium and zirconium are much more, uh, more heftier metals. And if you look at the periodic table, you say, well, how does titanium and zirconium fit in with the same chemistry of silicon and, chem and carbon, uh, they're totally different on the periodic table. But if you look at it according to valence, as uh, Dr. Uh, J.F. High did for Dow, you see that the tetravalency of the silicon and titanium zirconium on the valence table of elements shows silane, titanate, and zirconate all lined up to react with carbon and aluminum. Now, Ed Flutabin, God bless his soul, was inducted into the Plastic Hall of Fame, and he's credited with creating a class of materials known as silane coupling agents. It's no small thing. It's a $2 billion industry. And uh, the, a lot of the radial tire capabilities with silica and silanes are, are really incredible achievements and in, uh, improving uh, sliding resistance. You no longer slide when you have wet surfaces. Uh, and, and they're capable of bonding to similar materials with each other. And these were introduced in the 50s, and Pluterman really championed them through the 70s and 80s. Um, Monty came along. Uh, uh, the Silane book was published in 82. I published my 340-page reference manual in 84. I was also inducted into the Hall of Fame along with Ed. Uh, Ed was much earlier than me. And I uh, uh, I'm credited with creating these heteroatom titanate and zirconate coupling agents. And uh, I've been battling this thing uh, with silanes for uh, half a century. And uh, I guess I'll do it until <laughs> I pass the other side. What was interesting about our technology back in 74, which made the uh, front page of, uh, uh, of plastics uh, uh, news back then, it was the Modern Plastics Magazine. It was hailed as a new couple of for Phil polyethylene. This was revolutionary because you were talking about calcium carbonate. You were talking about polyethylene with no curative. And uh, the, the silanes didn't work on calcium carbonate carbon. So the plastic industry thought they finally had a way to cheapen up plastic with calcium carbonate by extending it with coupling agent. Um, and this was revolutionary because if you get Pluderman's book and read page 114 in chapter five, it says right in the book, surfaces that show little or no apparent response to silane coupling agents include calcium carbonate, graphite, which is graphene, and boron, like boron nitride. And if you go to Gilleste, which now was purchased by Mitsubishi, and get their book on silane coupling agents, you'll see the selection of the silane is based on the concentration of surface hydraulic groups, the type of surface hydraulic groups, and the hydrolytic stability of the bond form. And they give you a chart showing the efficacy of the silanes. And on the left-hand side, you see it goes from poor to excellent 
And then on the right hand side is my table showing that not only do we work on all of these interfaces, but we also work on sulfur, sulfide, sulfonamides, azodicabanamid, polyolefins, graphite. And we start to be sound like, you know, we, 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 we're blowing smoke, but we're not really. This is what they do. And you'll see that when you get into investigating these materials, they'll work on materials like uh, hydroxyapatite, in which uh, in Pruden's book, he says, there's only a slight improvement with the hydroxyapatite. And if you look at work done by Vass and other people, they show the control in a polymer without coupling agent, and then the phosphato uh, zirconate, and then the two bottom SEMs are amino zirconate and amino silane. And you can see the, the zirconate is outperforming the silane in that interface. Um, and and uh, in addition to that, um, I'm going backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, we work on magnesium hydroxide and other materials uh, that uh, are not that great with silanes and barium sulfate, the same thing, drooling mode and other aspects of the, of the interface. Okay, if you take conductivity as a key factor in batteries, for example, uh, we'll take nickel powder and silicone rubber and just with a, a one third of 1% of the couplings, couplings by weight of nickel drop the resistivity significantly. You can see the the ammeter on the on the left with no titanate has a high resistivity, low conductance, and the right hand side the needle drops all the way to the right, and you're getting high conductance. Okay, that goes into metal oxides, digital copy toner, polymer magnets, and smart coatings. Uh, it's being used on this uh, experimental um, uh, hypersonic uh, uh, airplane. Uh, for reasons I can't disclose, but uh, the same kind of beneficial effects. Uh, adhesion of fluoropolymers to, to the glass interface has always been a problem. And uh, the University of Ulm did a study on acoustic uh, emission analysis, and they showed that normal e-glass, a silane-sized glass, does not work well, well with nonpolar polymers. But by adding the uh, aliphatic amino zirconate, they get excellent adhesion. And that paper is available. But the, the functionalities of the difference between the silanes and, 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 and the titanates and zirconates are no hydraulic groups. We're not pH sensitive. It's proton reactive. You can add it directly into a mix. You can do in situ coupling. You don't have to pre-treat. And the, you form a nanoatomic monolithic for complete adhesion and other benefits. And you resist aging and corrosion at the interface. The big difference is we don't use water. We don't need water to couple. We don't need hydrolysis. It's straight proton coordination with no byproduct. If you look at the literature of silanes, it's a four-step hydrolysis process. And look at the right-hand bottom of that thing. There's water of condensation deposited on the silane coupled interface. And to me, that's an Achilles heel. And if you look at Pluteman's book on page 114, it says, from the observations, it must be concluded that water cannot be excluded from the interface between resin and hydrophobic mineral reinforcement, and the effect of water will vary with the nature of the mineral surface. Silane coupling agents do not exclude water from the interface, but somehow function to retain adhesion in the presence of water. Well, you don't want water boiling out the nano interface between the filler and the fiber when you're doing water boil tests. Okay, and, and we've shown that. Uh, this is a, on the right-hand side, uh, is a fiberglass reinforced composite. This is actually a tube used for an anti-submarine uh, warfare device. On the left-hand side is the fiberglass being shown through the epoxy. And when you get the hydrostatic pressure deep in the ocean, you get delamination. They put a, an aromatic amino zirconate layer and the glass disappeared because there was no uh, refraction of light at the interface. And this is a lot what uh, General Dynamics saw in their studies on glass and carbon fiber and Kevlar fiber reinforced thermosets. In glass fiber, the silanes worked well. They improved the age properties, uh, but the amino zirconate was superior to the silane. And they went to carbon fiber. There was no contest. They didn't even evaluate the silane. But look at the age property of the control. It drops after 240-hour 10% salt water boil from 62 down to 21. And the zirconates are practically unchanged. That is a significant achievement in a carbon interface thermoset resin. You're gonna get the same thing with graphene. Okay, my last patent was issued February 7th of this year. And um, there's been a call to action because graphene is not working in concrete because concrete and uh, uh, I know I'm a civil engineer and part of my education, uh, it, it, the, 
the amount of structure in doing uh, uh, tests according to the uh, concrete industry is as rigid, if not more than high voltage cable and in other industries. Very difficult to change. And we found that by surface modification of the ordinary Portland cement, we could reduce the cement to water ratio by 31% to the equivalent flow. And we were able to take in this pattern and demonstrate that we could take oil-soaked sand, which, which is a mixture of aromatic nabinic and aromatic hydrocarbon with seawater and sand and Portland cement and water and with just one part in a in a, uh, in a thousand of the composite, composite totally compatibilize the hydrocarbon with the cement interface. The hydrocarbon carbon disappears because it's coupled to the metal oxides that make up Portland cement. Okay. Uh, in our reference manual, in the first beginning, the details of selection, and we have a lots of information on polarity, curative, which one to use. And it's, it requires a detailed discussion because uh, these are the chemistries that you can apply, all right? And uh, they depend on whether it's water insoluble system, water multifiable, water soluble. Uh, it depends on the chemistry of what's required to get the couple of to the interface of the graphene dosage. Uh, we have found, for example, in epoxy that you need 5.7 to 8% of of an aromatic amino zirconate to couple the graphene. With graphene oxide, you need 2.9. With CNTs, it varies between 3 to 5.5% or 0.4% by weight of the epoxy, whichever is the greater number. So sometimes it's the percentage by weight of the polymer phase that determines the dosage that you use, okay? More is not better. The exact amount is exactly what's needed. And sometimes you work out these odd Doses of 2.9%, 5.7%, because that worked, that's what worked the best. Okay. There are millions of titanates in a drop of titanate. And you have to hit the interface of the inorganic or graphene phase dynamically. Everything's got to be moving. Spray application to a henschel at 1,800 RPM. Okay. Or completely solubilized in the water phase or emulsified in the water phase. If you're going to have the coupling agent in an organic or water phase, it's got to hit the face in a moving dynamic system. This works well because we're putting the coupling agent into the uh, C20 aliphatic mineral oil first and then adding the calcium carbonate uh, uh, on the shear. Okay, and that's the same chemistry that you get with the titanate as you do with metallocenes. And we get into that, but basically you get you need complete distribution, solubilization, or emulsification to get the dispersion. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the fact that these are a little over one and a half nanometer according to their length of the carbons. And if you try to put the uh, titanate into water phase, uh, when I first gave my first talk at Pluterman Center, Mr. Monty, our experiences at Saline's make. Uh, titanates make terrible couple gauges because they're hydrolytically unstable. And he was talking about the Tizors, uh, like TBT and uh, TIPT, and we weren't making those. We were making new animals. So, you know, what, sometimes what you think you know, it ain't so, and that's the biggest problem you have is uh, being uh, having a mental mindset for something new and novel, and that's what graphene guys have to run into. Oh, it's just carbon block. Well, it's not. Uh, and uh, solubility in the organic phase is important or emulsified. And we did a little study of uh, how important it is to uh, make sure that you get the coupling agent properly emulsified. The blue circles show that as we uh, mix ethoxylate and nanofol into the water insoluble like a 38, when we got to one to one ratio, we got a good emulsion. And when you get that good emulsion, and then you go into looking at 80% calcium carbon in water and you're putting the coupling agent into water phase first, look at the viscosity drop by working the uh, coupling agent. Uh, if you look at the viscosity, we dropped it from 3,600,000 out of 3,000 center points with just a half percent of the coupling agent, by uh, which was only 50% active. So it's only one quarter percent of the titanate uh, doing that viscosity drop. And the reason is we've got the water and soluble coupling agent into uh, a, a phase that is now soluble. I'll give you a demonstration of what we call exfoliation. This on uh, the left-hand side is a commercially available 34% 20 nanometer silica salt gel. In other words, this is the way you buy nano silica. 
okay we said okay let's have what happens when you stir in 2.4 percent we got to that number by trial and error uh it's uh, and we found that as you add the the titanate quad into this silica solid gel you explode so much silica interface that it absorbs all the water the water disappears there's no difference between the material on the left and the right except for the 2.4 percent of the pyrophosphate or titanate uh causing this the, the silica to, to the agglomerate if you take those two jars and you leave them out on a, on, a, on a bench for two weeks the left hand side shows what happens to the water as it disappears the silica nano silica is agglomerated on the right hand side is the titanate keeping the nano silica from agglomerating and you're going to see the same thing in graphene okay you're going to have to do those tests and a lot of studies have been done on functionalizing graphene with titanate coupling agents this was done in australia and which they looked at the this one they're looking at is the uh pyrophosphate titanate and their conclusion is that it significantly improved the dispersion stability of the RGO in the polymer matrix and it increased the tensile strength from 17.78 to 40 point, and the elongation from 249 to 424. It's the same thing we see in, in carbon black rubber and, and, and other, other systems. Uh, the graphene exhibited excellent long-term corrosion resistance superior to solvent pore and polyurethane graphene. So basically what they're saying is that the uh, the uh the the next study was on chelated non-chelated tight age functionalized graphene nano sheets and we now order based alkyds and they saw in this study and let's look at it closely they saw that to improve the stability of reduced graphene rgo and aqueous dispersion and facilitate the dispersion of graphene and composite coatings couple agents are generally utilized to functionalize the rgo the interface compatibility between an RGO and Apollo matrix can be enhanced, and the micro defects in matrix can be eliminated. It's in China. China is going like the hammers of hell on this technology. Okay, uniform distribution. We offer these materials as 100% liquid, 65% powders, and 20% pellet, depending upon your uh, uh, process, because it's critical to get the coupling agent into the polymer phase uniform before it meets the interface. And uh, we had experience making these additives in Henschel's and in extruders to make the pellets, and they're available. When you're doing a Henschel treatment, you got to add the filler, uh, uh, no hydrolysis is needed, you close the lid, you turn it on to low speed, and you add the titanate to the fluidized bed of the material, post mix for a minute, and it's done. There's no water, no pH, no anything, okay? And it's the same thing, adding the coupling agent to the polymer phase in the hopper, and then adding the graphene or the uh, material to be coupled downstream, watching your temperatures, lowering the temperatures to get, maintain the shear, keep your amps up, keep the work energy up. Sequence of addition is you add the liquid graphene, uh, you add the liquid graphene organic mass of batch to the mixing bin, turn the agitator on, and then you add the coupling agent drop -wise. In other words, if you already got graphene already master batched, Agitate the hell out of it, and then add the coupling agent into that vortex dropwise slowly. Okay, uh, in situ fill the coupling. You put the coupling agent into the you know, liquid phase, and then you add the graphene while you're agitating. Okay, what are the next steps? All right, um, tiny samples need to be arranged for uh, proper evaluation. Uh, it depends on the customer. We 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 do uh, uh, NDAs. Uh, uh, we really are not looking to license this technology as far as the titanates are concerned for this application. Uh, we have a standard MDA if you need to tell us something that you don't think anybody should know. A lot of our original patents have expired, and we're looking right now to surface, uh, looking for licensing the surface modification of Portland cement uh, because it's going to be done on the control conditions in a modern cement lab or plant. And I'm looking for a sodium bicarbonate producer who wants to mimic the uh, uh, azodicabatamid uh, decomposition because azo has become a substance of very high concern. Um, but that's the conclusion of, of my talk today. Uh, I've tried to give you a, a very fast outline in about 180 slides as to what we're doing. A lot more to go. And my conclusion is that you can form atomic monolayers on a carbon. You can react in situ in the water phase or in the organic phase. You can do one and a half nanometer agglomeration and you use your nano techniques and titanates and zirconates will be for graphene composites. What solids are for fiberglass? Thank you. Well, thank you, Sal. That was quite quite a quite a tour of of the uh, of the chemistry and the experience. 
Um, we do have one question from the audience, Al, and that was, um, there was a lot of presentation and discussion about the electrical conductivity um, of the material. And the question is, what, what about, what is the effect of using these um, titanates or uh, zirconates on uh, thermal conductivity? Yeah, <clears throat> most of the study on thermal conductivity has been done with boron nitride. And uh, there are several um, SABIG GE patents on boron nitride and thermoplastics using my material. Uh, they found 0.45% uh, of KZTPP by weight of the boron nitride they were using. But the thermal conductivity is the same as electrical conductivity. It's a function of deagglomeration, complete dispersion, elimination of air and water at the interface, a continuous phase, and you will get thermal conductivity. If the particulate in question is a thermal conductor, it will make it more efficient. Okay. Um, so you covered um, a number of application areas. Um, the last one, you know, focused on uh, concrete and cement applications. Um, there were examples of using this technology in elastomers, composites, both thermosets and um, thermoplastics. W what applications do you think are best suited for what you have here? Uh, I go into everything from rockets to lipstick. I mean, you know... Uh... The interface doesn't know what kind of a composite it's in. The atomic number and the, you know, the materials in, in any composition really don't know that they're being designed for lipstick or eyeshadow or, or propellant to kill the enemy more efficiently. All they know is this is what occurs when you put these dissimilar materials together in a composition. And what we do at the atomic level, in the nanoatomic level, is really independent of, of the particular market. We, we work, I've got customers doing everything from uh, copy of toner to adhesives to to cosmetics to uh, injection molding, uh, sharpness for knives. You know, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> another question from the audience. Um, what volumes are typically available for the for the coupling agents? And, you know, is there a minimum, a minimum size to use and no, we 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 uh, we have a sample policy. Two hundred grams is standard, uh, but we'll go up to twenty pounds if the customer needs that. Depends on on the process. Some people only have a uh, compounding equipment out uh, or pilot plant, and when you're doing plastics, you need a five pound sample. But if you're doing liquid thermosets, you can work with two hundred grams and do a lot of work. Um, we uh, ship the materials no charge. Customer pays the freight. Shipping samples has really become a very significant cost factor. And uh, if the customer doesn't want to invest in the freight, they're not interested in developing the technology. But we'll provide the materials free, no charge. And just to make sure I understand correctly on the business model, are you doing toll processing or is it mostly you're advising and consulting uh, the client how to use this material and then you're providing them with the <clears throat> line? We, we, uh, when we moved from Bayonne uh, to Tennessee, we went to straight chemical production. We're only making plasticizers and coupling agents in Tennessee. We sold off the dispersion, dispersion business, one aspect of the flow polymers in Cleveland and the other uh, two, uh, Chrysil on silicone uh, master batches in, in, in Maine. Uh, so the dispersion business we don't do anymore, but we had all the equipment and did all the study and I mixed, and I mixed and mashed coupling agents in polymer composites in our laboratory for for four decades and uh, that experience is still there and, and the data that we collected is still there and it's in our literature. Um, no, we don't make any master batches anymore. Uh, we actually contract out to make the pellets and the powder. But we do we do uh, the synthesis uh, because it's just become too complicated in compliance, regulatory compliance to do all the operations in one facility. And the guys who are doing reactions don't want powders in their plant. You got to have a powder plant that's got the uh, dust collectors and the whole system so that it passes uh, inspection by OSHA and everything else. It's, sure. it's complicated. <laughs> no, that makes sense. What's, yeah. what's the best way for a graph? You know, we have a lot of graphene producers that don't necessarily have all of the functionalization skills. There are companies that just focus on functionalization. Yeah. What, what is the best way for um, a graphene company, do you think, to interface with you? Um, well, uh, get an end, get an end project. Get something that you need to do to have the graphene working. Uh, 
and uh, define what that polymer is, define what the composition is, what the project goal is, and what do you try to achieve, what kind of mixing equipment you have to do this, and how do you intend to, 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 to use it. And, and you get into the discussion of details, it becomes a complex three-page email <laughs> with a lot of information. Then we select one or two what we think are the best chemistries or based on historical past performance. Uh, these are the ones that we think will work. And then it's a lot of Edisonian trial and error on the customer's part to get it to work and to have a very positive attitude because every failure is a data point on the curve to success. And boy, I can't tell you how many times I mixed concrete before I got to get that cement pattern. Yeah. And it just so, takes, so, it takes so a not, lot of sweat. So not, not just working with the graphene companies, but the graphene co companies customers, I imagine, is important because, yes. um, again, you, you've got the end user there. Um, a couple more questions, um, and then we're going to have to conclude, I think, with, with the time that we have. But uh, first of all, um, is it possible to functionalize HBN with a titanate and or zirconate to reduce its coefficient of friction? Yeah. I, I, let me just tell you one story. Uh, Hungry Hungry Hippo is a game Hasbro makes. The guy comes up to me, he says he's having trouble with the Hungry Hungry Hippo. I said, what's the problem? He says, I'm getting wear on the interface of the hips on the hips as the uh, the friction of the uh, of the of the styrene on the styrene is causing a groove and the game starts to not work right so i said i bet you tried everything from graphene to steel rates to waxes he thought i was a genius because i knew that i said no all you're trying to do is reduce the coefficient of friction i said what you really need to do is to realize that the styrene is really hips is just a sbs modified styrene and you really got rubber modification of a styrene and it's a polymer blend it's not a copolymer why don't you do in situ copolymerization by adding the coupling agent to the injection molding machine in the form of a pellet and you'll cause the SPS to copolymerize with the styrene you'll increase the hardness and you'll eliminate the coefficient of friction issue he says what the hell are you talking about I said look just take the pellet put it in the hob at one percent Low the temperatures. Calls me back he says you son of a bitch that worked like gangbusters how the hell do we do that I said Friction and the coefficient of friction is had to be understood in terms of his physics and what's causing the wear. And the answer is yes, we can. No, we can't. Depends upon uh, the mechanism of, of the coefficient of friction. Understood. Okay. And then the uh, last question we'll take is just about the samples and how stable they are over time. Do these degrade? Do they oxidize? Or you know, do they do they change over time? How how, how shelf stable are? Uh, some of them are very stable. They'll last for for literally years and uh, but we put a one-year guarantee uh, on on the material just because our lawyer said we should and from a liability standpoint but uh the amino uh, uh, uh titanates and zirconates could be sensitive if you don't close the lid they can oxidize and they can harden on the surface and uh, some of them will precipitate with aging we've worked very hard on on getting the right solvents and uh, we we get it with n-methylpyrrolidone on some of them and then then and nmp has been put on the substance very high concern list in europe and now you can't use that so we try to use a dmso methyl sulfoxide that works but you got to do a modification nothing is easy but the answer is we give you a material that's been commercially tested and works and we'll put a a six month to one year guarantee on it Understood. Um, so, Sal, you know, what I take away from this, you know, you, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned a lot about deagglomeration and exfoliation of the, of the platelets, of the individual graphene platelets. I think that's itself of interest. And then unlocking some of the properties of graphene with this surface modification, depending on uh, very specifically what the end application is and what property you want to derive. But uh, we saw there was uh, strength, there was uh, thermal property changes, friction properties interface with host material. So um, long story short, I think what's interesting is if companies want to unlock more of the properties of graphene, which are already extraordinary by themselves, um, taking a look at this form of functionalization um, is certainly in the toolbox. From the graphene council perspective, we've always seen the particular type and form of graphene is critical to be effective. Um, the ability to disperse it into a host matrix because it's almost always used in something else it's never used by itself is a critical component and functionalization is one of the ways to enhance that dispersion and interface with the host material so i think that's you know my layman's terms because i'm not i'm not a chemist myself but my layman's terms um 
from today's presentation is that you have a whole toolkit on how to unlock um, some of these properties and make it perform better. Yep. Excellent. <clears throat> Well, Sal, listen, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. We're going to um, distribute the slides and the recording of the presentation for those who would like to play on demand. And of course, you have the contact information if you'd like to get a hold of Sal and the rest of the Kenrich team um, about the solutions that they provide in the materials. Uh, thank you, Sal. Thank you for that. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank we you. hope you found today very interesting and informative. Take care. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. For more information and to connect with expert partners, contact the Graphene Council at thegrapheneCouncil.org.